have to start, let, let this face it, we have to start with Darwin. We're going to talk about Evo Devo. We're going to talk about embryos and evolution. We're going to talk about selection and constraints. Darwin said, if you look at the embryos and the adults of animals, you see that the common features, the backbone, you have two paired limbs, these features that are shared in common by a species are evidence of common descent. The differences between animals, Darwin says, are due to natural selection. Selection modifies different parts of the body plan to give different features. But the embryos of different animals are much more similar than the adults. What Darwin said was that if you look at embryonic similarity, this is evidence of also common descent. Now that's where we have a big problem. If you look at what Darwin said about his two pictures, and that one of them is a dog and one of them is a human, embryology will reveal to us the structure, in some degrees obscured, of the prototypes of each great class. We move on to our dear friend Ernst Haeckel, and this is from Anthropogeny, 1874. And Haeckel said, if we look down a row, young, middle, old stage, top to bottom, same species, if we look across, we're comparing embryos of different species at the similar stage. Fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, pig, deer, rabbit, human. At the early stage, according to Ernst Haeckel, they all look exactly the same. But it gets more complicated because if we compare a diagonal, we're looking, for example, at a fish, an adult fish, Look at these gills here in the adult fish. We go across and we see the same things, well, if you like, in the embryonic human. In other words, we have recapitulation. Of course, you're comparing ancestral characters in a young embryo with a primitive feature in an adult ancestor. Hackle is saying in the early stage there is no indication of the hind limbs or the forelimbs in any of these young embryos. That indicates that the primitive condition is to have no limbs. If a structure is present in the embryo, that indicates that it's a primitive feature for that group. What happens when we look at where he actually got these pictures from? He actually copied these from, well, we think from Richard Seymour. The late stage, well, looks okay. The middle stage, yeah, reasonable. But the early stage, where he says that the limbs are missing, and therefore it indicates that the early an ancestors had no feet. Here's Richard Seymour, four limbs, hind limbs, and there is Hackle's copy, no limbs. He's removed them. So the only way you get a true recapitulation is by actually doctoring the photos. These are real embryos. If you look at the early stages, they're actually quite divergent. Let's go on to some real proper scientists who I really adore. I mean, I think um, if you look at Carl von Baer, he said early embryos look very similar because Carl von Baer had these little embryos in alcohol and one of them was a reptile, one of them was a bird, and one of them was a mammal. And he couldn't tell the difference. And, um, of course, Stephen Jay Gould said, this is because embryos do not recapitulate other adults, they recapitulate embryos. This is the big difference. Hackel said that embryos are a sort of portrait gallery of your adult ancestors. And von Bayer and Gould are saying, in fact, in your embryo state, you're recapitulating the embryos of your ancestors. My view is I quite like Stephen Jay Gould, and I quite like uh, Von Baer. I'm not wild about Hackel. Um, let's have a look why. And this is some data from our own um, research group. We've looked at embryos of the dolphin, the spotted dolphins, the attenuata, and we didn't, before you um, come and attack me, we didn't kill these embryos. We got them from, um, they were caught in tuna 
fishing nets. So please don't, um, please don't come and mug me after the presentation. But we've got these wonderful dolphin embryos. Let's just have a look at the adult. Somewhere around here there will be a blowhole. You will see also flippers. These are modified forelimbs. No hind limbs. The hind limbs have disappeared. And then on the tail we have these flukes. So we have a typical vertebrate, but these are not like limbs for walking on the ground. There are no fingers. The hind limbs are gone. The blowhole is here and so on. So the question is, what do the embryos look like? There is the blowhole on top. And in fact, it's formed from the nostrils that migrate onto the top of the head and they fuse together and form one blowhole. There are no hind limbs, but look at the forelimbs modified into a flipper. This is a fairly old fetus. What happens if we look at a slightly younger one? This is a very young dolphin fetus. Nice forelimb bud, nice hind limb bud. Why is it making a hind limb? It has no hind limbs in the adult, but it's making a hind limb bud. And there's no blowhole on top. That is where the blowhole will come from, the two nostrils. What happens a little bit later? Let's have a look. Hind limb is kind of disappearing, and then a little bit later, almost no hind limb, and then a bit later, there's the flipper. The hind limb is almost completely gone. Look at the nostrils. They're just fusing together on the top of the head. In fact, we know that dolphins evolved from, probably from hippopotamus-like animals. What this means is that the dolphin shows indirect development. In other words, it goes to all the trouble of making two nostrils that migrate. Hind limb. Why does it need a hind limb? And it makes a tail that initially has no tail flukes and then they eventually develop tail flukes. So the dolphin, instead of devol uh, developing straight into a dolphin, it goes through these kind of ancestral conditions. The second thing we can see is that the hind limb in the dolphin is vestigial. In other words, it made a hind limb and then the hind limb disappeared. We think that probably the hind limb in the dolphin embryo dies back because of programmed cell death. So it makes a little hind limb bud, a bit like the snakes, makes a hind limb bud, and then that dies back through program cell death apoptosis. So we have indirect development and we have vestigial structures. Why would an embryo, why would a dolphin bother to go through ancestral pathways? Why would it make a hind limb? Why would it make two nostrils? Why doesn't it just develop a hole on the top in the embryo? Well, we think this is because of developmental constraints. In other words, the embryo if you say to an embryo, and I'm being very teleological here, if you say to an embryo, I want to make a dolphin with a hole in the top, the embryo says, I'm sorry, I don't know how to make that. It says, I know how to make hind limbs, I know how to make two nostrils, but I don't know how to make an animal with a hole on the top and no hind limbs. So the poor old embryo is limited in what it can make and we call that developmental constraints. In other words, the embryo cannot sim simply cannot make that phenotype. So the embryo makes what it can, and then later it gets modified into the, uh, the, that weird dolphin body plan. What's the evidence for this? This sounds all very um, abstract and um, not terribly convincing. So we published a study recently in Nature, and we looked at the limb. The typical limb of a tetrapod has five fingers or five toes. And we thought, well, okay, there's one group, which is the dinosaurs and the birds, that have lost lots of fingers and toes. The chicken wing has three fingers. One and five have disappeared. If you look at a horse, the horse runs on digit three, four limb and hind limb, because if it had five digits, the horse would, you know, it's too heavy. So it, it has a very efficient way of running on three. So animals lose fingers and toes, no problem. But in what way do they lose them? Here we have a cat. Cats have four fingers. Sometimes they have six, but it's rare. This is a cassowary hind limb, three fingers. 
this is a gazelle, two fingers. Because if you want to run quickly, you don't want to have five fingers, it's too heavy. This is an ostrich. It really runs on one finger, just like the horse. You see, digit three. And then my favorite animal of all time is the sloth, which hangs in the trees. And you can see that the hand is a bit like a hook. It's much more efficient to hang like a hook on three digits, so they lose digits. We're looking at digit loss. We have a crocodile. This is the archosaurs. So we're looking at crocodiles and birds. The forelimb, one, two, three, four, five digits, no problem. The hind limb has lost one. Look at the emu, only one digit in the wing. Because it doesn't fly, it doesn't use the wing for anything. Most flying birds have three digits. And then the running birds, like the ostrich, it has, as we've already seen, digit three and digit four, so no problem. What on earth goes on in the embryo with these um, animals that have lost digits? Okay. Your emu wing, one digit. In the embryo, it makes one, two, three, and then possibly one, two, three, four even earlier. Look at the ostrich hind limb, one big toe and then a tiny little digit four. A little bit earlier it makes one, two, well, two, three, four, and then a bit earlier it makes one, two, three, four, five. If we have a look at the ostrich, this is the adult, a great big digit three. That's what it runs on, a bit like the horse. It's a digit four, it's disappearing, there's no claw. But if you look at the embryo, one, two, three, four, five. Again, an example of indirect development. Selection wants a hind limb in the ostrich with at least, well, really, one digit. Because the moment of inertia is less, it has one digit, it's less weighty to run. But the embryo says, sorry, I'm going to have to make one, two, three, four, five. Why would the embryo bother to make five digits when the adult only needs really one? This is evidence of constraints. So if you look at, for example, the rhesus monkey, this is a very early stage. It looks incredibly like a human embryo. As we go forward, this is nowhere near like a human. And it's only when you get to these much later stages that you start to see the difference between the species. And have a look at this. This is a forelimb of a rhesus monkey. No one would think that was human, but as you start to go back in development, you could almost think this was a human hand. And perhaps the most important of all is the face. So you have a really orthonaphic face of a chimpanzee fetus, flat-faced. Of course, later that will grow elongated, it will look dog-like. But at this stage, it's pretty much, well, okay, maybe it's not human-like, but it kind of looks a little bit ancestral. It kind of looks a little bit ancestral. So you have these um, echoes of your ancestry in your embryos because of developmental constraints. And then... As you get older, those constraints get overwritten by species-specific differences. So you have to think that selection cannot call forth any possible structure that you want. Because the embryo will say, sorry, I don't know how to make that. Ideally, you should have eyes in the back of your head, as I said earlier. But the embryo will say, I'm sorry, I can't make eyes in the back of my head because that's where my hindbrain is and I don't have the lens placode there and I can't make this. So you have to think embryos will only do what they used to in the most teleological terms. And um, whatever selection calls for, you can only go for what the, the phenotypes that have been produced by the embryo. And the embryo is the most conservative thing in the world. So I'd like to finish there and hand over to Marcelo.